Good morning. If you never noticed, I always look over at Sarah to make sure she's done with her prelude because I don't want to stand up in the middle of it. But with our beautiful harvest decorations here, it was like there's this little gap between the piano and the lid, and I can see her, and she can go give me a little eye like, yep, yeah, we're good. <laughs> good morning. Welcome to worship on this October 6th. It is certainly feeling like fallout. This today is World Communion Sunday. We celebrate the table, the sacrament of our Savior, with Christians around the world today, not just here uh, in Erie, but all over the place. We gather on this special day for this festival, which has been running for, oh boy, 100 years now, I do believe. Uh, it was started in Pittsburgh at Shadyside Presbyterian Church and has spread all over. So we know that as we gather at our table today, we are doing so with sisters and brothers in the faith all over the place. So it's a wonderful day to celebrate. Take a look at our announcements for this morning. We have our items for the West Mill Creek Food Pantry. Get those in uh, the shopping cart. And don't forget to fill out a mission slip and put it in the blue box. Uh, we continue our adult education class at 9 o'clock in the Sunset Room. The kids' education class is downstairs at 9 o'clock. We're always asking folks to be a greeter or a snacker. If you want to help with greeting, speak to Becky Beam or speak to Marie Callahan about snacks. And we do have our food and fellowship following worship today in the library. So stick around for snacks and fellowship and conversation. Also, please note that uh, the crop walk money is due by October the 13th. Please get that into John and Karen, or you can put it in the crop walk box just as you're coming into worship, or you can always drop it off at the church office. Any of those things are available. Just please get your money in. You still have time to get other uh, donors and sponsors, but please get it in by the 13th. Our ongoing mission opportunity up here, which continues to grow, we're asking all donations for that to be in by October the 27th, so the end of this month, so that we can uh, get them all sent over to the Mercy Center for Women. And don't forget, we have coming up very shortly the rummage sale for mission. That's Saturday, October 19th from 9 to 3 in the gym. Bag day is on Monday the 21st. We're always asking if people could help to set up for the rummage sale. So we need volunteers from uh, the 14th through the 18th. And of course, on the day of the sale, that's morning into early afternoon. The work's really quite fun. Uh, so if you can come and help out with that. If you have gifts and treasures that you would like to donate, just give us a ring in the office and we'll be able to open everything up for you so that you can place them in the storage areas so we have everything set. So we've got a lot going on this month, but that's wonderful because it's our fellowship, it's our worship, it's our service to our God. Friends, as we open our time of worship on this World Communion Sunday, we should do so with prayer. Would you pray with me? Oh God... You are our God who is, our Creator God, our Heavenly Parent. We ask you to bless us with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships. Bless us with anger at injustice and oppression and the exploitation of people. Bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain rejection, starvation, and war. And bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can and we will make a difference in this world. In your most holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, join me in our call to worship this morning. We gather from west to the east. South to the north. To celebrate the God of peace. With us in our acts of peace. This God of peace accompanies us. In each and every circumstance around us. We praise God's name. Amen. Friends, let us stand and sing together our first song here in this place.
Friends, please be seated. Would my young disciples join me up front? It's going to be a tight squeeze. Why don't we try over here? There'll be a little bit more room just on this side here. There you go. So today we celebrate, as I said before, World Communion Sunday. So we are thinking about the entire world and how all the peoples of the world are coming to gather at the communion table to receive the bread and the cup, and we celebrate this all together. Now, I thought this year, we've done a lot of things in the past, but I thought this year maybe you should taste what bread is like from around the world and how they celebrate their communion. So, I'm a big fan Can I get my lovely assistant to assist? Uh, hold the big tray. I'm a big fan of buffets, where you can try a little bit of everything. So I'm going to show you these. These are our little display here of the different breads from around the world. So let's start, first of all, with the bread from Mexico, Central America, and South America. Does anybody know what that kind of bread is called? That is called a tortilla. So I have the real ones, not the flour ones. These are the corn ones because that's what they actually eat in that part of the world. They eat corn tortillas. And I'm going to give you all a piece for you to be able to try this. None of you are allergic, right? Nobody's allergic to anything? Okay, if you scream, I'll know that that's a, that's a yes. So everybody gets to try a piece of tortilla. If I can get it out of my bag. There you go. Go ahead and try it. Smell it. Taste it. There you go. You can try the whole thing. See, Quinn, Quinn's my man. He just goes right into it. You just got to get into it, right? It's pretty good, right? Yeah, that's not too bad. Yeah, you're not too, you're not too keen on it. That's the face I made. That's I the face, yeah, that's the face she made. All right, so let's try our next bread then. This one is our naan. And naan comes to us all the way from India and Pakistan and some of the countries that are right around there. They eat a bread called naan. So have you try a little piece of this one as well? There you go. <laughs> I think they all taste pretty good. There you go. And there you go. And there you go. So that's naan from India and Pakistan and some of the countries that are around there. Yeah, OK, we like that one a little bit better. All right. So let's try next, let's try our, I keep forgetting the name of this one, Pita, thank you. Pita comes to us from, find it here, let's get to it, oh, I went the wrong way. Pita comes to us from the Middle East. And so a lot of countries in northern Africa here, and all through Israel, and uh, that region of the world, so this whole region, they like to eat Pita, and this is a pita, okay? Mm-hmm. So this is pita bread. Two of them stuck together. This little one. This one. There's a little one. Oop. And there's another little one. All right, so that's pita bread. Yeah, that's pretty good, isn't it? Well, let's, let's stay close to home. We're going to try this one here called matzah. Matzah is something that is eaten in Israel, which is, I'm looking, looking, looking. Where's my map? There's Spain. I've got to go over a little further. It's over in here, okay? They eat matzah. Now, this might remind you of something else that you have had in your life. 
This one is not a soft bread. This one is a harder bread. There you go. Does that remind you of anything? Is that like a cracker? Yeah. Just doesn't have any salt on it whatsoever. It's really good if you eat it with something called hummus. Mm-hmm. See? Hummus. Delicious. All right, let's go to Europe and try something that is famous there, even though it started in one country. It's famous all over Europe, so all over this region. It's this one here called the baguette. The baguette. Started in France, but then became very popular all throughout Europe. You can get it all over Europe today. It's one of my favorite breads. Go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That one you probably know a little bit better because it's a lot closer to the types of bread that we eat. Now, there's some places in the world that don't really eat bread. Instead, they eat rice. Not tofu, rice. They eat tofu there too. But they eat rice. They don't really do a lot of breads there. And those are places that we go all the way over here to Asia. So places like China and Japan and Korea and throughout this whole region of the world, they eat a lot of rice instead of bread. And any breads that they do have, okay, yeah, she's going to hand you a spoon. This is called basmati rice. It's a special kind of long grain rice. It's delicious. It's even better if you eat it with something from Indian cuisine. So go ahead and eat that. It's just plain rice. Nope, go ahead and take the whole spoon. Oh, that's all right. We have vacuums. Go ahead and pick it up and eat it. That's how, they, that's how it's eaten in, in Asia. They generally don't use utensils. They use their hands to pick things up. There you go. Mm -hmm. Not too bad. And for the very last bread, it's not really even a kind of bread. It's actually kind of a cookie. Yeah, you can put your spoons back on the plate if you're done with them. That's fine. And if there's any breads that you don't like, you can put them there. Or if you want to take them back for others to share, you can do that too. Just go ahead and throw it. The last bread we have is from the place where we all came from as Presbyterians. This little tiny place up here. Let's find it. Let's find it. It's called Scotland. Scotland. It's way up here, okay? And it's this little one here, and I think you guys are all really going to like this. It's not really a kind of bread. They call it shortbread, but it's not really a bread. It's more of a cookie. This is, like I said, something from Scotland. Yeah, that one's a lot better, isn't it? It's a lot sweeter tasting, right? So as we are celebrating communion here today, we are doing so using some of these breads. And people who are like us, who go to church all around the world, they use all these different kinds of breads to celebrate their communion. It's what makes sense to them in their land where they live. So I wanted you to try some of all of these different breads. Look at all this. And there's even more, but these are just some of the ones I got. I could have got you even more. But we started with these. So let's thank God for the church everywhere and as it celebrates today, World Communion Sunday with all these breads. So let's pray. Loving God, we say thank you for the church everywhere around the world. We say thank you for the gifts of grain and flour and wheat, all the things that make up these different breads so that your church can celebrate your love, your peace, and the presence of Jesus Christ in the way that makes sense to their culture. God, be with us today as we pray for these people and as we worship and come to the table together. Amen. Amen. All right, let me get this out of your way. No.
No. I never pass up on shortbread. Never going to happen. Friends, let's go to God in prayer this morning. Would you pray with me? From every place on this planet, we turn our face to you, O God. Gather us, all your people, together to pray. In the midst of the forces which would separate us, bind us in your love as the church, together. Strengthen us through the grace of your people gathered, no matter how we gather with the truth of your presence. In a world aching to be made new, we cry out with those who suffer the pains of what powers and principalities extract from the world's poor. We cry out with those suffering from illness and disease at whom the world turns a callous glance. We cry out with those stinging from the sins of racial supremacy, We cry out with those seeking justice, equality, and peace. In a world stretching toward wholeness, we celebrate with those whose lives bear the fruit of your spirit and seek to share in your call to partnership. We celebrate with those whose efforts are making the world new. We celebrate with all who gather to earnestly seek your transforming work in the world. Make us a world that grows into the shape of your communion table, where all people are welcomed and all are fed. Make us a people who grow your family by practices of mutuality, generosity, and justice, sowing seeds of peace in every action we take. And may we be found to be witnesses when Jesus returns to the truth of who we were created to be, people who belong to each other, people who belong to you, O God. Hear now, in the name of your Son, Jesus, the silent prayers of your people here and around the world. Amen. Scripture reminds us that wherever two or more are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, he is there with them. Friends, the church gathers this day around his table to celebrate his resurrection and to look forward to his return. Friends, this is good news. Amen. Friends, our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Job. How many of you have ever read the book of Job? Good. There once was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There was no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. 
The Lord said to Satan, very well, he is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. We hear next from a sermon from the book of Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels. But someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Friends, would you pray with me for just one moment? Lord, speak to these people whom you love through your most imperfect vessel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A friend recently asked me a really, really good question. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? And interestingly, I didn't have to think at all. This is a question that I have held since I was a kid. And as I've gotten older, as I've learned more, as I've studied more things, that question has never gone away. A lot of questions I have found answers. Maybe not that I'm right, but that I've found make good sense and maybe explain some things. But this one question, of all the questions, if I got the chance to ask God a question, this one question remains. Why mosquitoes? Why mosquitoes? I have thought about flies, and as annoying as they are, they have a huge helpful purpose in our ecology. I've thought about Fungus. I even watched a six-part documentary on fungus. Yes, this is how exciting our house is. <laughs> and there's a purpose for fungus and other things. But the more I kept coming back to mosquitoes, I couldn't find a purpose. Think about what a mosquito does besides buzzing around your ear and ruining your, you know, your holiday barbecue. Mosquitoes carry wicked, nasty disease. West Nile virus, Zika virus, malaria, dengue fever, yellow fever. All of these horrible things. And when you really dig down even further into it, how bad are mosquitoes here in the United States? We sometimes complain that, oh, they're real bad this year. But really, how bad are the mosquitoes here? 
they're not that bad. They really aren't. We don't have the problems. Now, some of that's maybe where you live. If you were down in you know, the Gulf Coast area, maybe a lot, it's a lot wetter there. But think about places in Africa and in the developing world in South America. Mosquitoes run rampant, and children die. Adults die of dengue and West Nile and yellow fever. The question that sticks in my head is not really actually just about mosquitoes, but it's about the question of evil. It's the question of why does bad stuff happen? God, if God is so darn good and holy and righteous and pure, then why do these bad things happen? Why do mosquitoes disproportionately affect the populations of countries and lands and people who can't protect themselves? Who don't have access to, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of the things that we have. The different uh, repellents and insecticides. Why would God allow these little creatures that they don't have to exist? There's no creature that I found that solely relies on a diet of mosquitoes. So why do they need to exist when they inflict such pain and sadness and depravity and evil in the world? Why, oh God? Why? The entire book of Job, for those of you who have read it, <clears throat> is a study in the question of evil. The Odyssey is what it's called. But have you ever noticed in your reading of Job what we read this morning? We've all come to believe that it was, and we pronounce the word Satan, who harmed Job. Did you pay attention in the reading, though? Satan is our word. It's our concept. It's our idea. In the world of the Job text... The word is ha-satan, hence why I read it that way. Ha-satan, and it means the prosecutor. Notice also where the satan's presence was. If he's so evil, if he's so bad, if he's so depraved, why is he hanging out in heaven with God and all the angels and all the other holy beings? It's because ha-satan is not a bad guy. Ha-satan works for God. Ha-Satan is the one who is kind of considered God's prosecutor, God's henchman, carries stuff out for God. It was an understanding of that role in the ancient day that there was such a being. A lot of other cultures had this sense about them as well. Our idea of Satan is some external evil force that's always picking at us, always trying to get us to do evil. That is a construction of Christianity that Idea does not even appear, that idea, the word shows up, but the idea behind it does not appear even in the New Testament. So this one evil force out there doing all of these malevolent things, that's us. That's us. That is we humans. Think about the logic of the thought. If there was an evil being out there telling us what to do, pulling our strings, telling us to do evil and to go out and to harm other people, then why in the world do we have jails and prisons? There would be no point. Because everybody would be able to stand up in court and say, the devil made me do it. If that is so, then let's turn SCI Albion into a, I don't know, a hotel or something, a homeless shelter. Because if that is so, then we don't need jails and prisons. Evil, we find out, comes from us. In the book of Job, you'll notice at the beginning, the part of the passage that we read today, who is the one who is ultimately responsible for Job's evil and suffering? Yeah, you don't even want to say it. God. The authors of the book of Job were making such a fantastical writing, such a fantastical myth. They were trying to get people to pay attention to see that that makes no sense. And so we would get you to, it was a hook, 
authors use a hook to get you to read, to read the rest of the book and to see the discussions and the arguments that happen between Job and his friends who come to, quote, comfort him. The book of Job is not saying that God is the author of suffering. They're using it as a foil in this case. It's a literary technique. Nowhere in Scripture do we see that God is listed as the author of suffering, evil, and death. Just this one little place, and it's again meant as a literary device. So, whew, God isn't the source of evil. When Job's friends show up, they sit with him on the ground for seven days while he mourns and he cries out. And then on the eighth day, apparently, they open their mouths. Had they stayed in the silence of the seven days, it would have been perfect. But instead, they started to speak. The first one of Job's friends says, Well, Job, the reason why all this bad stuff came to you is because you're not that good of a guy. You're a bad guy. And you deserved it. The second friend comes to Job and says, Well, Job, all of your children were killed. Wiped out. That's also part of the story. Um, all of your children were wiped out because they were jerks and they deserved it. Imagine saying that to a grieving parent at the loss of their child. No matter how good or how bad that kid was, that is their child. The third friend is not very creative and he takes some hybrid path between uh, it's your fault and it's your children's fault and they deserved it. And the fourth guy just kind of shows up out of nowhere. He wasn't spoken of before. And he explains that God is righteous and merciful, and we can't ever understand what God is up to. So stop asking questions, Job. As I've often said when talking about the book of Job, when you have friends like this, you don't need enemies. Just keep these guys around. So we can read the whole book of Job, a theological treatise on theodicy, and try to understand, okay, what does this mean about evil? And you can read through all the chapters of Job, which I've done many times. It's one of my favorite biblical books completely. And at the end of it, you just have more questions than you have answers. So where is evil? Where does it come from? Where does the suffering in this world come from? Well, theologians talk about two different forms of evil. They talk about natural evil, which we've just horribly seen with Hurricane Helene. And my God, we're about to see it happen again with Milton. Which I'm sorry, it's probably not right to make this joke. But when you call it Hurricane Milton, I'm expecting a dude with really thick glasses and a comb over. And that is just not what's going to happen. The other form of evil... It's called moral evil or willful intentional evil. Natural evil we have no control over. We can't all get our fans and try to blow the hurricanes back into the ocean. These are things that happen in a natural broken world that we can't control. Hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes and floods. We can't stop them. They are just going to happen and they have happened forever. But the other side, the idea of moral evil or intentional evil, that's on us. That is our freedom of will to be able to do the good or the evil. And as Calvin reminds us, we so often choose the evil because it's, it's fun. It gets us money. It gets us power, prestige. We don't want to admit that part. We don't want to look in the mirror and realize that maybe, just maybe, we are complicit with evil. And so in Christianity, we've created this character. We've created this force, something that Jesus himself never talks about, interestingly. In fact, in his famous prayer that we offer, the Lord's Prayer, he refers to evil as simply just a dark, amorphous force, something that is out there, but he doesn't name it. He doesn't say it's this creature, this character. We do that. Because like usual, we want to get out of it. I didn't steal the money from the bank officer. The devil made me do it. I didn't slam in the back of that guy for cutting me off in traffic. The devil took hold of the wheel. No, I'm greedy, and I want that which does not belong to me, so I robbed the bank. I thought that guy's life wasn't worth anything, so I slammed into the back of him to teach him a lesson. Evil is in our hands. 
but so is good. The book of Hebrews is an entire sermon, and we can read through it, and it is this wonderful study in Christology, the, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and it's, it's fascinating, but it's also a look into who we are as humans, as creatures, as reflections of God's goodness, of God's will. And we hear it right in the middle of the passage that we read today from chapter 2, that God gave all things over to us, put it into our hands, into our fiduciary control, our responsibility. It doesn't belong to us, but God allows us to be in charge of it. Part of what the author is not saying is that evil is in our hands, but is reminding us that good is also in our hands. We get to choose between the good and the evil. Which one will we do? That is our will. That is our free will. That is our choice each day to make. You have all exercised your free will. If you really stop and think about it, you've all exercised your free will in about 400 different ways just getting here today. You chose to get out of bed. You chose the clothes that you're wearing. You chose the route that you would take. You chose to talk to certain people. You chose all of these things. We have this freedom of choice. We have this ability to be able to choose the good and the evil. We don't want to admit that. We don't want all that responsibility resting on us. And so the common refrain that we hear very often is the similar refrain to my question. Why mosquitoes? God created all things for a purpose. I'm still trying to figure that purpose out. But don't you think that if we invested some of our smartest minds, some of our money, some of our time, that we could eradicate or severely impact mosquito-borne illness in developing nations? It has been done. And it can be done again, and it can be done even greater. But it's when we choose to do the thing that which is good. And the good rarely benefits us. It does in a kind of a big holistic sense, but it's not a one-to-one -one trade. But that's how we have come to think. If I'm not going to get anything out of this, why do it? We've failed to recognize that the welfare of our neighbor is our welfare. If they are well, we are well. Just think about it in even a very selfish term. If your neighbor's house was on fire and you're very close to them, as I used to live in Pittsburgh, you'd very well want to help them put out that fire because otherwise it's going to hurt your house. Why don't we do this more? Because it doesn't benefit me. Because it's not a problem in my neighborhood. We think on a day like this, like World Communion Sunday, that yes, there is the good of the church gathering at Christ's table to receive His grace, His love, His presence, His power. But it also reminds us of the church in places where it's not so easy to go to church. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. None of you stopped, were stopped at a roadblock. No armed guard asked you where you were going on your way to church. We have religious freedom in this country. Christianity is not under persecution in the United States. I don't care what anybody says. If they're saying that, I'd love to see where it's happening because it just ain't happening. But in North Korea, in China, in Sudan, in Israel, in Ukraine, yeah, it's hard to be a Christian. We get to choose the good or the evil. It's in our hands. It's in our choice. It's in our responsibility about what we will do with the world and for the world. Not just what we will take from the world, but how we will help the world. How we will be, as the Hebrews author is reminding us, the reflection of God in the world. That as he quotes, it's actually from Psalm 8, that we are a little bit lower than God. We are to be in the world as God's representatives, as Christ's ambassadors, doing his good and showing forth his good reflection. We have to stop blaming other people or some other source that, well, the devil made me do it. 
God, why don't you just come in and fix it? There's this wonderful cartoon of Jesus, well, very stereotypical Jesus, and a guy sitting on a park bench. And the man says to Jesus, Jesus, how come all the wars and famine and hatred and violence? And in the next panel down, Jesus is saying, yeah, I was about to ask you the same question. We can't be directly responsible for everything in the world, so we have to do, as uh, John Wesley reminds us, to do all the good we can, in all the ways we can, for all the people we can, for as long as ever we can. That's our job as Christ followers, to do the good, to ignore the evil, to stay away from it, to confess it and repent from it when we do it, and then seek again God's good way shown to us in Christ. It's not just for us. In fact, none of it's for us. It's for our neighbor. It's for the world. It's for the future of Christ's church. Evil and good are both in our hands. Which one will we choose? Which one? Amen. Friends, Scripture reminds us that people will come from east and from west, from north and from south to sit at table in the kingdom of God. Friends, this is not my table. This table does not belong to this church. This church is a representative of whose table it is. This is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He invites us by His grace and His love to come and receive His body and His blood. All are welcome to come and receive at this table. Friends, as we gather at our table this day, we also gather with our sisters and brothers around the world. So let us now pray for them. Let us pray for the world. Let us pray. We pray, O oh God, that as we gather at the table of our Lord Jesus Christ in Fairview, Pennsylvania, in Vienna, Ohio, and everywhere in between, that your spirit would unite us with our sisters and brothers in the faith wherever they worship you and gather at tables today. We pray, O oh God, that our eyes would be opened and our hearts softened in this sacrament, that we would be able to learn from the examples of faith from those who are homeless and refugees, who while running for their lives and seeking freedom will stop to worship you. We pray for the church suffering in silence, hidden from oppressive governments and dictators. We pray for the church which knows nothing but violence and murder from gangs, cartels, and unjust warlords. We pray for the church which has been our foundation, but which now is crumbling from age and decay. We pray for the church ignored and set aside because of unjust racism, injustice, creation, destruction, and pain. And yet, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise because in all of these places and circumstances, your people have remained faithful to your love, witnessing to your justice and humility, sharing the good news of Jesus and gathering at his table. And so we pray, O oh God, for your church among those with no place to call home. May we learn from their searching faith and may we be a place of welcome for all who seek safety rest, and peace. May our sisters and brothers running for their lives in Israel, Palestine, Gaza, Ukraine, and Russia, may they know your peace this day, and may the world know the fullness of your shalom soon. We pray, O oh God, for your church in places where it flourishes, and we confess the times and places when we have enslaved our brothers and sisters. May we learn from the vibrant faith of our African brothers and sisters, and may we build a more just and peaceable world. We give you thanks for our sisters and brothers of the upper northern presbytery of Ghana, who by their witness, they share your love in worship and action. We pray, O oh God, for your church in places where Christianity is dangerous, politically or socially. May we learn from the steadfast 
steadfast faith of our Asian brothers and sisters and walk with, who walk with Jesus through every trial. We pray for the oppressed of China, North Korea, and all other lands where proclamation of the gospel may lead to imprisonment or death. We pray, O oh God, for your church in places beset by violence and yet still colored by hope. May we learn from the persistent faith of our Latino brothers and Latina sisters, and may we look upon them with compassion as our neighbors. We pray for the church, especially in Mexico and Colombia this day, and give you thanks for our sisters Barb and Rosemary in Honduras, who do your holy work each day. We pray, O oh God, for your church in places where its power is diminished and its followers are few. May we learn from the age-old faith of our European brothers and sisters, and may we live our faith boldly so that our faith might live on from generation to generation. We pray for our sisters and brothers who worship you in ancient cathedrals, which now sit nearly empty from lack of use. We give you thanks, O God, for the Taze monastic community, seeking to reinvigorate the faith in Europe, and for the Church of Scotland, our mother church, from which our faith sprang so many generations ago. We pray, O God, for your church as it exists in every land. May we learn from the earthy faith of our Native American brothers and sisters, and may we care for the land and all those who call it home. We pray that we would gain the understanding of our Native American family, whose stolen land we stand upon, that we would find care, compassion, and love for the earth, our common home. Come, Holy Spirit, and dwell in this bread and in this cup, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ. Come dwell in your people of every land and language, that we might be united with one another and be the body of Christ in every corner of the world today. Amen.
at this table how on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus was eating with his disciples in the upper room. He took bread. He blessed it. He broke it and he gave it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. In a similar way, after the supper ended, pouring out the cup, he said, this cup sealed in my blood is for the forgiveness of sins for you and for many. Do this in memory of me. Friends, we are assured that every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, that we proclaim the saving death of the Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Would the elders come forward, please? Friends, you're invited to come up the center aisle to receive the bread and then out either side to receive the cup. Sue is over in the corner for those who would like prayer with anointing. Come, my friends. The feast is ready.
My friends, let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you call us from all across our world to come and follow you, to receive rest and comfort in your presence. You invite us to your table where we get to receive you and meet you. You inspire us and empower us at your table. You send us out into the world to be your holy people, doing your good and refusing evil. May we all in this world who have received the sacrament this day be bolstered, ready to go on, to continue being your people. We pray this in your name. Amen. Friends, let us stand and sing together our final song. final song is known famously as the prayer of St. Francis, make me a channel of your peace. May we seek to be a source of God's good and love in this world, to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and to show him active and alive and at work in us, in this world that God loves. Amen. <laughs>